Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Physiology Learning. In today's discussion, we are going to study about the descending tracts. In our previous discussion, we are discussing in our motor system, wherein in our previous discussion, we saw that the motor cortex which is preparing the action. Once that action is prepared in the mental makeup of the brain, they send their fibers down to the muscles and final action is carried out. These tracts which carry the impulses from the motor cortex to the periphery are called as descending tracts. So, we are discussing our motor system under which we will be discussing our descending tracts today. So, this is one of the most important topics even for MCQs as well as for the theoretical papers for MBBS examinations. So, it is a must, part, must know part for the MBBS students. So, coming to the learning objectives of today. Today, we are going to learn about the classification of descending tracts. There are some modifications also which I will tell you. Then corticospinal tracts, then corticobulbar tracts, then tectospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, vestibulospinal tract, rubrospinal tract. So, let us dive into the topic. What is the classification of descending tract? Most of you would have heard the term that is pyramidal tract and extra pyramidal tract. But that is an older classification. But still some examiners specifically ask pyramidal tracts and extra pyramidal tracts. But nothing to worry, it is pretty simple. The older classification goes like pyramidal tract and extra pyramidal tract. What is pyramidal tract? The most important tract that is the corticospinal tract. In all this descending tract, the term will be spinal tracts because from the higher regions in the brain, they are coming to the spinal cord. So, their name will be something like corticospinal tract, rubrospinal tract. The spinal tract will be the suffix for them because they are reaching the spinal cord. So, the pyramidal tract here, only one tract is considered as pyramidal tract. That tract is corticospinal tract. Rest all other tracts, whatever tracts we are going to study, they are called as extra pyramidal tracts. So, if the question is asked between pyramidal and extra pyramidal, just remember that corticospinal is the only pyramidal tract and rest all of them are called as extra pyramidal tract. But there is a special newer class classification which goes like medial pathways and lateral pathways. Depending upon the functionality of the tracts, nowadays they are calling the tracts as medial pathway of tracts, then lateral pathway of tracts. They are anatomically also distributed medially one group of tracts and another group is distributed laterally. And their functions are also exactly opposite of each other. So, that is why they have been separated as medial groups and lateral groups. Let us try to understand if there is a group of tract which is coming medially, what they will do is they will help in positioning the medial region of the body. So, what are the medial structures? The medial structures are the axial part of the body as well as the proximal portions of the limbs. All of them are in the midline of the body. So, these medial pathways, they are innervating the axial body as well as the proximal limb. What is the most important function of the axial body and the proximal limb? They are for positioning. In our motor cortex itself, we saw this middle portion is for positioning, whereas the distal portions is, is helpful for the fine movements and fine actions in the body. So, this helps in this medial pathway helps in posture and gross movements, whereas the lateral portion which goes in the lateral side of the medial tracts, they go in the lateral side and they will give their fibers to the distal portions of the limb. So, these group of tracts are called as lateral pathway of tracts. They are giving to the distal portions of the limb. What is their action? Their action is fine movements. So, this is the present classification that you have to remember. I strongly suggest all of you to write the newer classification also. That is the medial pathway of tracts and lateral pathway of tracts. Now, let us try to name the tracts which are present in the medial pathways and lateral pathways. So, coming to the medial pathways first. The, in the medial pathways, we have the corticospinal tract. In the corticospinal tract, whenever we study about corticospinal tract, there is two groups of it. One is the ventral group, another one is the lateral group. So, this ventral is nothing but our medial corticospinal tract. So, this medial corticospinal tract and three more tracts are included in the group of medial pathways. So, what is the function of medial pathways? They control the posture as well as the proximal limb gross actions. So, what are the other tracts? The other tracts are grouped as medial descending pathways of the brainstem because these other tracts originate from the brainstem region. It can be any part like the midbrain, pons, medulla, it can be from any of them, but they originate from the brainstem region. That is why the other three are grouped together in the medial descending pathway of the brainstem. In that, we have actually four tracts. That is the first one is tectospinal, 
second one is reticulospinal third one is vestibulospinal and what is the fourth one this reticulospinal tract it arises from two places one from the pons another one from the medulla and both of them are different in functions also so ideally we have four tracks in the medial descending pathways of the brain stem that is the tectospinal pontine reticulospinal then medullary reticulospinal then finally the vestibulospinal pathways so all this five tracks together are called as the medial system of pathways or medial descending pathways now coming to the lateral tracks the lateral tracks are very simple to remember there are only two tracks one track we already saw that is which portion of the corticospinal tract the lateral portion of the corticospinal tract is a form of lateral pathway and another tract which is called as the lateral descending pathway of the brain stem and there is only one lateral descending pathway of the brain stem that is the rubro spinal tract now let's try to understand the individual functions of all the tract now coming to discussion of the most important topic that is the corticospinal tract along with corticospinal tract there is one more group which is called as corticobulbar tracts what is this corticobulbar tract that is very simple we'll finish them first so corticobulbar tracts these are some tracts which originate from the motor cortex because it is written corticobulbar bulbar means it gives the motor neurons to the cranial nerves so whenever it gives its motor neurons to the cranial nerves it is called as bulbar tracts so what are the cranial nerves it gives its fibers the cranial nerve trigeminal then facial then hypoglossal so these tracts which give their fibers to these cranial nerves are called as corticobulbar tract so basically they are going to innervate the facial regions and the upper portion of the neck region so these are the tracts which are called as corticobulbar tracts now coming to the corticospinal tract this corticospinal tract what is their function that is the most important descending tract now whatever information sensory information from the body is going and reaching the brain they will be processed and the motor makeup will be made by the motor cortex and they finally descend and make the action done so this corticospinal tract arises from the cerebral cortex in the cerebral cortex we have various layers which we will read it in later lectures and it arises from the layer 5 this is also very very important this layer 5 of cerebral cortex this corticospinal tract originates and it originates from various different places all of us think that it just comes from the motor area it's not like that it has its origin from various areas from the m1 it gets around 31 percentage of its fibers what is m1 m1 is nothing but a primary motor area from a primary motor area 31 percentage comes in then coming to the premotor cortex here 29 percentage of fibers come in then coming to the primary somatosensory area see here pay attention that somatosensory area also gives fibers to the descending tract because obviously they have to keep on sensing the somatic sensation and cha make changes accordingly then parietal lobe they contribute about 40 percentage of the descending fibers in corticospinal tract so coming to the diagram here the cerebral cortex from the layer 5 the corticospinal tract starts and this tract was previously called as pyramidal tract why it was called pyramidal tract because this layer 5 had pyramidal cells and not only that they were forming the pyramids in the medulla which we will discuss then from the cortex it is going to the from the cortex it is going and reaching the place called as internal capsule this is the internal capsule this internal capsule is very very essential because most of the time the infarction or the stroke that is the ischemic stroke happens in this particular region internal capsule region this we will study in the clinical parts then from the internal capsule some of the fibers that is maximum amount of fibers they go down and cross over in the medulla so this portion is nothing but our medulla whenever they are going to the medulla what they form is they form some kind of image which looks like a pyramid it will look like these fibers are looking like this so that's why this tract is also called as pyramidal tract what are extra pyramidal tracts extra pyramidal tracts every other tract is called as extra pyramidal tract so they were forming the pyramids of medulla and they form the lateral corticospinal tract see one set of fibers are crossing to the other side in the pyramid these are called as lateral corticospinal tract 
This lateral corticospinal tract, what is their most important function? They are for the fine movements. Whichever tract is going laterally, they are for the fine movements. So, they are going to innervate the distal muscles. This lateral corticospinal tract con consists of 80 percentage of the fibers, whereas the rest 20 percentage goes to the ventral corticospinal tract. This ventral corticospinal tract, see here, they are not crossing over, they are directly coming to the spinal motor neuron. In the spinal cord, they give their interneurons and cross to the other side and finally, they will give their branches to the proximal group of muscles. So, proximal group is done with the help of ventral corticospinal tract or medial corticospinal tract and distal muscles are done with the help of lateral corticospinal tract. So, this entire slide is very very important because corticospinal tract is repeatedly asked questions even in MCQs as well as in case of VIVAS as well as the theory part of the examination. So, coming to the other set of medial group of pathways that is the medial brainstem pathways. Medial brainstem pathways we saw four that is tectospinal, pontine reticulospinal, medullary reticulospinal and vestibulospinal. And here I have mentioned two things, pay attention the upper limb I have mentioned, then lower limb I have mentioned here. If I draw a track till the down, for example, if I draw a track till like this, it means that it is innovating both the upper limb as well as the lower limb. Some of the fibers, we will be stopping at the level of the upper limb itself. What does it mean? It means that that tract is coming to the level of upper limbs and it will innovate the muscles of the upper limb as well as the head and neck region only. So, let us try to understand the first tract that is tectospinal tract. This tectospinal tract arises from the tectum of the midbrain. There is a specific region called as tectum in the midbrain from which the tectospinal tract arises. And see here, I have stopped it till the head and neck region only. It is not going and innovating down the lower limbs. So, this tract is primarily involved in controlling the head and eye movements. Now, coming to the pontine reticulospinal and medullary reticulospinal. Both these tracts go till the lower limbs. So, basically they are going to innervate the upper limb also as well as the lower limb also. And what do they do? They are giving their fibers to the gamma motor neuron extensors. So, it is very very important they are giving their fibers to the gamma motor neuron extensors. Among the extensor also, I told you before pontine is completely action is different from the medullary reticulospinal tracts. The pontine reticulospinal tract, they are stimulatory to the extensors. So, whenever the pontine reticulospinal tract is active, what they are going to do? They are going to cause extension. Whereas, the medullary reticulospinal tract, they are inhibitory to the gamma motor neurons of the extensor. What is gamma motor neuron? We have clearly mentioned in the proprioceptors chapter. So, please go and watch back it. These gamma motor neurons are nothing but the efferent fibers which are innervating the ends of the intrafusal fibers. We saw there is something called as the intrafusal fibers. And this gamma motor neurons are the one which innervate at the ends of the intrafusal fibers. So, this gamma motor neuron, they are not directly going to contact the muscle. They will innervate the ends of the intrafusal fibers and cause the alpha activation and alpha gamma coactivation will happen and finally, they can contract the muscle indirectly. So, this pontine as well as medullary, they are going for the gamma extensors. Now, coming to the final tract that is vestibulospinal tract. Vestibulospinal tract, this tract as the term indicates vestibule, it comes from the vestibular nucleus. What is the most important function of the vestibular system? The vestibular system along with the cerebellum, they help in the balance during the movement. And this vestibulospinal tract, it also goes till the way to the lower limbs and primarily, but they innervate the neck muscles. They primarily innervate the neck muscles and they innervate the proximal limb extensors. They also innervate the extensors and they are directly innervating the alpha motor neurons. So, this tract is capable of directly causing an alpha motor extension property. So, these are the four tracts which is acting medially. What is the function of all the medial tracts? They are helping for the posture as well as the control of the proximal limb muscles. Now, coming to the lateral tract. Lateral tract, we had only two tracts. One of them is the lateral corticospinal tract, which we discussed. Their fibers 20 percentage come directly and they innervate the proximal muscle group. Another lateral brainstem pathway is rubrospinal tract. This is one of the most important tract I would suggest to you guys to remember for MCQs because this tract is the one which makes all the difference in decorticate as well as decerebrate rigidity, which we will see in the next video. What is the most important property of this rubrospinal tract? This rubrospinal tract starts from the 
red nucleus which is located in the brain stem then they cross to the other side here i have shown this like it is crossing to the other side in our previous example also tectospinal tract i would have drawn it like it is crossing the other side so whenever i draw like this it means that it is crossing to the other side and innervating the muscles of the contralateral side this rubrospinal tract innervates the flexor motor neurons pay careful attention here it is innervating the flexor group of neurons this is very very important please remember this it is innervating the flexor motor neurons that is alpha flexors of the upper limb we have come here till the upper limb only it is not going to innervate to the lower limb they are primarily innervating the upper limb flexors so rubrospinal tract always they primarily innervate the upper limb flexors this is very important to remember we have seen multiple tracts but we will try to summarize all of them in one place so coming to the first primary division we saw that we have the lateral group and we have the medial group so what is the function of lateral group lateral group is for fine movements what is the function of medial group medial group is for gross movements lateral group we have two important tracts and before going to the tracts see here i have drawn here that is the cortex starts from here then the brain stem that is the midbrain pons and medulla then cervical hi here i have mentioned cervical if it is coming to the cervical what does it mean it will give its fibers only to the upper limb portion then i have written lumbosacral suppose if some fibers are coming till the lumbosacral region they are going to give fibers for the upper limb as well as the lower limb that is what this diagram all means now coming to the lateral tracts lateral tracts we have the most important tract that is the rubrospinal tract which starts from the red nucleus and goes till the cervical region it goes till the cervical region so it is innervating the alpha flexors of the upper limb then another tract which is a lateral tract that is the corticospinal tract it doesn't cross in the medulla it crosses down below so it is crossing in the spinal cord level so it is crossing in the dar spinal cord level so this innervates the distal muscle group they innervate the distal muscle group both the corticospinal tract innervate the alpha motor flexors then coming to the medial group of tracts we have basically the five different tracts one is the corticospinal tract this corticospinal tract see i have shown it here it crosses to the other side see this red nucleus is also crossing to the other side and tectum also will cross the other side innervate the contralateral region so this ventral corticospinal tract where does it go and innervate they innervate the proximal muscle group then what is this next tract this next tract is tectospinal tract it arises from the tectum this is the tectospinal tract and they innervate only the head and eye movements they innervate primarily the head and eye movements they control primarily the head and eye movements now coming to the pons and medulla in the pons and medulla we saw a common tract that is pontine reticulospinal tract and medullary reticulospinal tract out of which which is inhibitory only the medullary reticulospinal tract is inhibitory we can see here the medullary reticulospinal tract is inhibitory now coming to the last tract that is vestibular nuclei there is one tract arising from the vestibular nuclei which is called as vestibulo spinal tract what is the main function of vestibulo spinal tract vestibulo spinal tract is also similar to that of the tectospinal tract they control the head and neck movements they innervate the alpha extensors whereas pontine and medullary fibers innervate the gamma extensors and rubrospinal tract is innervating the alpha flexors this diagram is very very important for understanding the decorticate and decerebrate rigidity once we understand this diagram then decorticate and decerebrate in rigidity is very simple and easy to understand i hope it's clear thank you for listening we'll see in the next video thank you so much if you like my content share it to your friends and subscribe to the channel